We'll take a minute here uh, to get set up for our next presentation. Uh, Mark Wolbers, growing fruit trees in Alaska. Um, we have Mark Wolbers here. He's the president of the Alaska Pioneer Fruit Growers Association. And uh, I keep finding out other things, you know, I was on NPR and I heard him talking about the symphony and I just heard he was a professor. So I might have you give a couple sentences about yourself a little more than uh, just president of the Fruit Growers Association. But um, he's going to give us a talk on growing fruit in Alaska. Um, and I'm very excited for this because I, I have a few apple trees to start. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Mark. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to kind of move along here, hit this, just give you a real brief introduction uh, who I am and what organization I represent. Alaska Pioneer Fruit Growers Association uh, was started back in the, in the mid 1980s. And uh, its goal at the outset, and it still continues, is to find ways to um, successfully grow and crop fruit uh, here in Alaska. And uh, in the mid 90s, uh, we got to be turned into a nonprofit. And we currently have about uh, 300 members in the state, ranging from Kodiak all the way up through Fairbanks and, and beyond. And, uh, and basically, we're just about uh, trying to help people learn to grow fruit. Um, basically, our members, they pay a small fee to be a member. It's like $16 a year, so it's, uh, it's not too onerous. Um, but what they get in response for that is that um, they get a, basically a monthly newsletter. Um, during the season, we, we start off in April with um, a grafting workshop where we bring up uh, rootstocks from outside, um, share scion wood, teach people how to, to do that. Um, we're moving into top working workshops where we take existing trees and show people how to graft on existing trees that are growing in the yard, and that will be occurring um, early in mid-May. And then we do orchard and, and garden tours uh, during the summer so people can see things um, actually being done <laughs> and see what other how other people are kind of doing it in person. Uh, then we move into the fall. We have apple pressing. So we own our own uh, fairly. We have two large uh, apple presses and a, a really good grinder. And so our members can uh, bring their apples in and we uh, help them press them for cider. And then we have apple tastings. So we usually have an early and a late apple tasting or fruit tasting. Um, I should say fruit tasting because it isn't always just apples, uh, usually in September. And, uh, and so people can um, find out what variety of fruit they actually really like because none of the names are, are known, right? Not, nothing that we grow up here that's successful uh, you would find in your local grocery store. And so, and everybody's apple taste, and I'll get into this a little bit, is a little bit different. Um, and then during the winter months, we do a, a online speaker series. Uh, uh, one of the benefits of the pandemic was that uh, we discovered that instead of flying up speakers from outside, uh, we could just do this on the internet. And so, uh, um, and that happened right as I took over the club. I, I, was, I was trying to really encourage the club to bring in outside uh, extension people and whatnot to, to talk to our members. And then uh, uh, one unfortunately uh, died in a car crash right before, right before uh, it was Chad Finn. I don't know if any of you know him. He was a, a berry expert from the Northwest. And uh, another one of his colleagues stepped in at the last minute and said, hey, I can do that by Zoom. I'll fill in for you. And, uh, and then that's what kind of launched it. So this past year, we had uh, Zoom presentations on um, soil. Uh, and then we had one on how to use your fruit to make wine with a commercial wine producer. Uh, one on hascaps or what they call colloquially as honeyberries uh, from Honeyberry USA company in the uh, Midwest. And then we uh, had a presentation from uh, the Western Agricultural Research Center in uh, Montana, uh, giving an overview of, of kind of what they were doing as far as plant testing and that sort of thing. Um, they grow at high elevation, and so in some ways they mimic a little bit our growing conditions. And so, uh, you know, having that kind of uh, interaction is, is helpful. 
So you want to grow an apple tree. Well, what, what kind of goes into that? <laughs> well, local knowledge is pretty much king. You know, uh, uh, basically you have to uh, kind of know your geography and your climate because uh, like even here in Anchorage, there are microclimates all through this, this area. You know, uh, if you're down by the inlet, it's going to be completely different than, you know, if you're growing up at a uh, thousand foot elevation. Right. So you have to kind of know that. And you can't be fooled by the USDA zone rating. All right. I went into Costco, uh, I think it was three weeks ago. Maybe it was only two weeks ago. It's time just kind of flips by. Um, but they just got in their shipment of apple trees. Gala. Liberty. Honeycrisp. And, you know, I went over to, I, you know, went up to the desk and said, hey, uh, is there a manager available? <laughs> <laughs> so these are all zone three plants, right? They'll, they, they will not be killed by, by the cold, but you also won't get ripe fruit off of them, right? Because the season is too long. And I'll get into that in a little bit, explain that. And of course, you know, the, the big thing that we really encourage our members to do as they come in and they're asking these questions is we, we have to say, well, let's, you know, what do you want to do with the fruit? Because that's really going to decide what variety is going to be appropriate for you. You know, you want a fresh eating, you want just to have, you know, fresh juice, do you want to make hard cider, or you just want to cook and can it, or do you want to make sauce with it, or do you want to make a dried product out of it? And so, you know, if you kind of put those things together, the equation, right, purpose plus hardiness plus season length, ding, right, that kind of equals your cultivar selection. And if you go to the apple tastings at, at the end of the season, now you can try this out. And the apple tastings are always set up with the apple on the plate with the grower who grew it, where their location is, and any kind of special notes, like did they cheat and grow it in a high tunnel, right, or things like that, right? And so the advantage is you come away from that and you go, oh, I love this apple. I want to graft this next spring. Who's the grower? Right? And so if it's something you think, well, I might have trouble getting that sign wood, you send an email to that grower. I've done this saying, you know, hey, Dan, uh, I really love that Lee 27. Can you bring me some sign wood at the grafting workshop? Boom, done. Right? And then I'm off growing that tree. So these are the tree fruits that uh, we're growing outdoors. We we do small fruits too, but since you guys are forestry, I'm just kind of talking about trees, okay? So um, basically apples, cherries, uh, plums, pears, apricots, and actually even some nuts. Of these, the, the ones that are uh, the knowledge base is, is the most deep on is the apples and cherries. Plums and pears are kind of next. Apricots is a really a work in progress. There are some man, mature Manchurian apricots growing here in Anchorage, but as far as getting cultivars to, to crop and survive, um, hasn't happened in my yard yet. Um, I'm in East Anchorage, so maybe I'm, I'm a little more difficult. And of course, nuts I've seen, uh, I have seen a, a filbert tree uh, actually uh, uh, pollinated and, and producing nuts, but I've only seen one in Anchorage in one year. Um, and of course, up in Fairbanks, right, if you've been out to, uh, oh, the big orchard outside of town, um, there's actually a Manchurian uh, walnut tree growing up there. And I, it actually had a couple walnuts on it when I was up there like five years ago or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, so nuts, I, I kind of tell people like, yeah, nuts, you know, I, you know, uh, my approach is that if I can't grow it better than I can buy it in the store, then don't, right? You know, part of this is that, you know, my roots are, I'm, I'm from Michigan. And so I grew up uh, with a culture of, of uh, apples and cherries. And I really missed that up here. And when I discovered this club and uh, found out, boy, you could do this and you could like have them grow your own apples and stuff. I was like, I was like all in because there's nothing like a fresh apple off your tree. So as you know, all cultivated fruit trees, or I should say most cultivated cut fruit trees, 90, 99%, um, they consist of two parts, uh, maybe even sometimes three parts. 
They consist of a rootstock, and which is paired with the scion of the cultivar that you're doing. And basically, uh, what you're doing is you're cloning. And so you're basically, you know, somebody discovered, you know, a, you know, a, from a seed got a tree, and they were like, "Wow, that's great! We're going to call that Honeycrisp." Well, then they start cloning that, right, through propagation. And it's not like, you know, you could take a seed from Honeycrisp and plant it and get a Honeycrisp. You can't do that. So the only thing you can do is, you know, take, take from one tree, graft it on, and clone it that way. Um, so these are the rootstocks that we bring up. Uh, we bring up about uh, oh, close to 2,500 rootstocks every year in the spring. So we bring in uh, a lot of apple. Like this year, we brought in 1,700 uh, Malus baccata. It's a seedling apple, full-size uh, apple tree rootstock, hardy to zone two. Uh, we're, for a cherry rootstock, we're using Crimps 5 now, which is a uh, fairly hardy um, rootstock that uh, is a little bit uh, semi-dwarfing. And in Plum, uh, we've been really pretty happy with Crimps 1. Uh, we're still bringing in some Prunus Americana or American Plum. Um, and we're, we're fussing with these. We're, we're, we're figuring out strategies to make them work better. Same thing with a pear, uh, Pyrus usuriensis, or what sometimes is called Harbin pear. Um, they, the growers in the lower 48, they don't want to use this as a, a rootstock for pear because um, it wants to induce early flowering. And lower 48, with the uh, onset of uh, climate warming, um, they're facing the same thing we're facing, which is more climate variability. And what that means for them is that the dangers of spring frost are going up uh, dramatically. And so all their rootstock development is actually towards trying to get um, things that actually retard flowering and delay it. So they want their cherries flowering later. They want pears flowering later, right? Trying to get out of that potential frost window. For us, it's not a problem. Um, because of our latitude, right, by the time the trees are coming into bloom, which is usually around end of May at the earliest, first part of June, right, because of our sun position and the length of our days, we don't have that, that frost worry, um, like to the extent that they do in the lower 48. Um, apricot, you know, like I said, we're using Manchurian. It, yeah, it, it, those, that's a tough road. So anyway, what you can see here is I've got a whole bunch of rootstocks that um, I've grafted and, uh, you know, they're just budding out. So this is uh, time-wise, this is in May, right? And they're all against the north side of my house and I'm waiting to move them out uh, into my orchard, basically, uh, to grow them out in the sun. Um, and this is where I basically, I, I torture the rootstocks in the wintertime. And I say torture because I leave them in pots over winter which is cruel, okay, but I want to know, like, well, is that, is that puppy going to survive in the worst case scenario, right, because I don't want to go through trouble planting it. The problem with the seedling rootstock um, is that um, with a seedling rootstock, uh, everything's variable. Hardiness is variable. Precocity is variable. Size is variable. Root anchorage is variable. Grafting compatibility is variable. You name it, everything is variable with a seed. I, I actually, I took a bunch of seeds from a, a red splendor. I have a red splendor crab apple, ornamental crab apple in my yard. And I just took the seeds and I, I sprouted them all and piled them up and every one of those looked different. The variability was just shocking, right? So half of them were redwood, half of them were white wood. Um, pointy leaves that almost kind of like you thought like, well, well who was the mother of this? A maple tree, you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, so the seedlings have a, uh, have a lot of inherent problems. In, uh, and well, basically one of the things that we're kind of struggling with is that um, seedling rootstock is, is a thing of the past. And with a, a lawyer's nursery uh, going out of business in the lower 48 a couple of years ago, there's only one nursery in the lower 48 producing seedling apple rootstock of any quantity. And that's Schumacher's in Minnesota. And frankly, between you and I, I'm kind of scared. Like, well, if, if that business plan uh, fails, 
what are we going to do up here in Alaska for rootstock? So I have up here orchards past and future. You and I, if you're old, if you're an old geezer like I am, we grew up with the old style orchards, which were freestanding full size trees at a spacing of 20 by 20 feet, grown on seedling rootstock. Nobody grows apples that way who wants to do it for a living. Okay. So if you go down to Washington State or Minnesota or any place they're growing apples and they're selling them commercially, they're doing what they call high density orchards. And basically they're, they're running uh, posts and wires north to south and they're putting uh, dwarfing uh, trees on dwarfing rootstocks and they're planting them as close as two feet apart. And you can pack thousands of trees in an acre by doing that way. And um, they're more productive, they produce more quickly. So economically, they're, they're better for the grower. So consequently, trying to, trying to buy seedling rootstocks, uh, who buys them, right? Only nurseries who are like producing trees to sell to places like Alaska, <laughs> right? So if you go up Wasilla, right? Uh, Mid Valley Greenhouse. He's a he's a a member of uh, Fruit Growers. He's got in um, you know trees on Dogal rootstock, right? Well, that's that's a seedling rootstock, but it's you know it's a hardy rootstock, right? But you know if you're living in Lower 48, you're probably not buying that because you're not really worried about your tree being exposed to a Zone Two type condition. Anyway, the advantage of cloning uh, clonal dwarfing rootstock, and these are produced clonally. Uh, is that every rootstock is exactly the same. And so you know, you can select for size, precocity, vigor, disease resistance, right? If you live in a place, you know, we don't, unfortunately, luckily don't, but if you live in a place that uh, is, is fire blight, you can get rootstock that impart resistance to fire blight. Hardiness, soil preference, right? Suckering, you know, climate response, will they go dormant at the right time? Um, limb set, you know, do they make things go like that or they give you a nice angle on your branches? Um, graft com uh, compatibility, um, virus resistance, and the commercial growers actually even um, dial this in to the cultivar that they're growing. Huh, right? So they can like, okay, I'm growing in this kind of sandy soil and I'm in the Northwest, it's a little alkaline and I'm growing a honey crisp, which isn't a terribly vigorous kind of tree. So here's the rootstock I'm going to use. It's really gotten amazingly honed in. So the quest begins, all right? Clonal rootstock for Alaska. What will survive? And against the north side of my house, which I've just recently moved out on the porch, is a bunch of Geneva rootstocks, the first three that I've trialed. I've got five more coming, hopefully within the next week or so, from Cummins Nursery in New York. And uh, looking at uh, kind of like, how do these do? Do they survive the, the pot, the, the, the winter in the pot <laughs> test? And, uh, and uh, you know, see what happens. In my orchard, I'm generally pretty confident I can take any of these rootstocks and they'll probably do fine. I have soil temperature tents, uh, sensors in my orchard and as six inches this past winter, they never got below freezing. My orchard is heavily mulched. It's on a, on a slight hill. Um, yeah, 32.6 degrees was as cold as it got during the winter. And because it's on a Southwest facing uh, slope, most of the snow is already melted off. Temperature's already up to about 35 degrees at six inches. So, so anyway, I, that's, you know, what we're doing is I'm trying to basically look uh, which of these Geneva rootstocks, you know, might survive. Um, because basically, if I can find one, uh, I know I, I have access to lots of them, right? Because they're commercially available. That's what growers are planning. So with these, uh, the, the advantages and disadvantages are kind of this, that um, if you get down to like a semi-dwarfing tree, there's enough root development that you can still have them as free, uh, freestanding trees. 
And so you, they're good for um, people's backyards or things like that. But what I'm also looking for is I'm looking for the more, more dwarfing rootstocks too, so that if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I wanna set up a UPIC operation, I have a recommendation for them. Here, use this Geneva 935. You can plant this three feet apart, put it on wire. You know, you'll have a super productive space because here in Alaska, you know, you're not gonna have a thousand acre, per, you know, farms, right? You're gonna have an acre or maybe a two acre spot if you're lucky, right? And uh, if you could plant high density, you could actually make that more economically uh, viable. You're still not going to make a living at it, but, but you'd, you'd make more money. So um, on the cherries and plums, uh, you know, the cherries were, were farther along with the rootstock. Uh, like I said, we've, we've kind of uh, zoned in on crimps five, and we've done that for a couple of years, and, and that seems to work fine. If people want something uh, smaller, uh, we recommend uh, Gisela five. That's a little bit more dwarfing. Um, uh, and actually, the, the tree that you see on the photo there, that is a gold sweet cherry uh, that I grafted on Evans cherry rootstock. So Evans, which you might have seen in your local uh, uh, stores, is sometimes sold under the trade name Bali. It's a cherry, basically, it's very similar to a Montmorency type uh, cherry. Um, and if you can find one that's actually not grafted, but actually is on its own rootstock, and I got mine from St. Lawrence Nursery. The rootstock freely suckers. <laughs> that's, a, that's a problem for a commercial grower, but for a home grower, it's like, hey, free rootstock. <laughs> so, so I've been uh, digging those up and experimenting with them because they, they're somewhat dwarfing. If you've seen Evans cherries, you know, they get up to maybe, I don't know, 10 feet, 12 feet at the most. So they're not a super huge cherry. And whereas gold uh, is a big cherry. And so uh, I wanted that on something a little bit smaller. And uh, talk about precocity, it came out of the first year after I grafted it, it sat out in a, it sat in a pot in the snow and it came out and flowered the first, the first year after I'd grafted it. That's not actually really desirable because you really want the plant growing, right? I like these flowers. I, this was last year, second year. I took all those flowers off after I took, you know, snapped my uh, my little photos, <laughs> stripped them off because I want I want it growing. Um, so anyway, that that's the experimentation going on with pears. We're looking, we're using this uh, uh, Pyrus usuriensis uh, rootstock, but it has some grafting incompatibility because when you're trying to graft European pears, you're really remote from from the Asian roots, uh, Manchuria, <laughs> and so. Uh, we're, we're experimenting with actually putting them what they call an inner stem in. And this makes graft, it makes, it makes your, your journey a little longer, but basically, you know, I got my rootstock last year and I grafted summer crisp on it. And then I'm going to let summer crisp grow. And now I'm going to graft my European pears onto that summer crisp. Right. And I could do that this year. I could just, you know, leave that much summer crisp on, on the rootstock craft on my European pear if I just want to grow in variety and I could do it that way. But I'm going to make a, you know, a multi-variety pear tree because I don't have much space, right? So I'm just going to grow this up, graft a whole bunch of different things on to see what does best and what I like. Uh, we're kind of experimenting with plums. We're kind of doing the same thing. There's a, uh, a variety of plum and that's uh, growing out in a valley called Feller's Plum. And uh, it seems to impart vigor and precocity, uh, which crimps sometimes kind of holds back. And so we're experimenting with that. Um, right arrow, there we go. So let's talk about climate because actually uh, when, when Clay first contacted me, he said, he was like, hey, do you know anybody come talk about uh, potential of commercial fruit cultivation in Alaska with a warming climate? So I got out the I got out the hose and I I hosed that idea down pretty pretty good. So I, I'd like to just point out I just gonna I have two slides here. I uh, two and a half years ago I put in uh, air, what they call an air temperature. Well, I put in air and ground temperature loggers in, and basically what these do is they record they keep a running record of soil of my soil and air temperatures at whatever interval of time I set. 
and I think I have my errors at like every 15 minutes or 10 minutes, it's, it's recording the temperature. And I can go back, I can pull this up in, my, in the software, and I can do some really kind of cool things with it. And one, it really gives me a great overview. So what, I, what you see here is the growing season for 2021. And in Alaska, um, we start that in April. And it basically, it finishes uh, in, in a good year, in, sometime in October, in a not so good year, September. And this blue line that you see here uh, in the middle going up, those are what they call growing degree days. And so when you're tracking uh, fruit tree development or even pest emergence, you can do this by, by, by taking, keeping track of these heat units, which are called growing degree days. And to give you a really rough example of what a growing degree day is, um, you notice that it says growing degree day, 42 degrees. 42 is my base temperature that I'm using. So that means if, if the temperature got up to 50 to 60 degrees as a high, and then at night went down to a low of 40 degrees, and you took and the average of those two, so you add them together, right? 60 and 40, that's 100. Divide by two gives you 50. At base 42, that means that day you've, you've accumulated eight growing degree days. Now, the, the, the calculations are a little bit more complex. And when I calculate, I use what they call a sign method in the software, single sign method. And this allows me to mimic what the various uh, extension services across the United States are doing. So they use 42 as their standard, and they have this method of calculating degree days. My software imitates that. And this allows me to basically compare without any regard to geographic location, allows me to directly compare when growing events and things happen, regardless of the fact that I'm here in Alaska. So and I'll talk more about this in a little bit, but I just wanna point out some things about the 2021 growing season. So here in April, if you look in this first, first box here, you know, it's 2021, boy, here in, in Anchorage, in East Anchorage, uh, this is temperature here. <laughs> Beginning of April, it's pretty dang cold, right? But then look at this, warmed up, days were over 60 degrees, but yet the nights were down in the 30s. So solar radiation. And if you wanted me to sum up one limiting factor here in, in growing fruit in Alaska, it is solar radiation. <laughs> because whatever heat you might get during the day, you lose it at night. And so it kind of doesn't matter that you got 16 hours of daylight, right? It can get up to 80 degrees in the summertime, and at night it's 40 degrees. So you get, you know, if you did, if that happened anywhere else in the country, it'd be up 80 degrees during the day, and it would maybe cool off to like mid 60s at night. And so the amount of heat accumulation units, the growing degree day units that you could accumulate would be much greater. You can see here at the end of the season, we topped out growing degree days. That's what the, the, the right-hand side um, numbers indicate. It was like 20, 2450, 2,450 growing degree days. There's not an apple growing commercially in the lower 48 that crops at that level. Zestar is the closest you can get, but you really need to be around 2,700 preferably 3,000 for Zestar. And those things, those other things like, you know, that you're buying in the store, the Fuji, the Honeycrisp, all that, you know, it's somewhere between 3,000 and, and 4,500 um, growing degree days for those. But you can see the effect of solar radiation, right? These big jags that you see in the temperature log, that's your, that's your, your peak in the day and your low at night. And that makes it pretty tough. I'm going to scoot over this side and then show you um, the, the fact that climate warming doesn't really help. 
<laughs> or not, not in the way that you might think, right? So here's September. This, this little, between here and here is September. And looky right here. In my orchard, that's a 20 degree night. September 20th. And guess what I was doing September 19th? I was picking everything out of my orchard that I could possibly pick. I had people coming over and helping me. Because like, oh, crap. I got to get things off the tree. And only the midst, what we call up here in Alaska, you know, we in the fruit growers group, we kind of talk about our apples as early apples, mid-season apples, late apples. Right. And, and what that means is that if it's an early apple, it's coming right maybe beginning of September. And if it's a mid-season apple, it's middle of September. If it's a late season apple, end of September. And anything after that's an aspiration apple. It only happens in freak years. Okay. That season ended, man, mid-season just got ripe. Right. So, you know, ironically, like one of my apples, Carol, which I really love, it was that perfect, perfect spot to pick. I mean, that came off. That was beautiful. But I had some other apples that were like, whoa, a little unripe. So this doesn't change. I mean, I don't care what kind of climate warming you have. Solar radiation at night can end your season abruptly. And if you're a commercial grower, the one thing you don't want is a surprise, right? You don't want to be sitting there one year and, and being able to crop something and the next year having it being unripe. That's not a way to run a business. So here's last year. <laughs> so, you know, April, yeah. That's so bad. Look at these, you know, pretty good daytime temperatures, right? So we're actually getting a little bit of growing degree day accumulation happening in April, unlike this year. <laughs> and uh, look at these, you know, temperatures, 80 degrees. Holy smokes. You know, I don't know how, how long most of you have been in Alaska. I've been here 30 years. When I came to Alaska, yeah, we never saw any 80 degree days. Right. If you had five days over, you know, over sunny and above 70 degrees, you'd be thinking like, you, this is a great summer. Right. No, not anymore. I mean, certainly we're getting we're getting warmer temperatures. But look at the look at the other side of that. Right. 80 degrees, 40 degrees at night. So you get you're getting a little warming. Right. But you're not getting you're not getting what you think the impact of that warming would be because you, you lose half of it at night. I'm not saying I'm not grateful. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it because, you know, looking along, it goes along. It helps to the scoring degree thing. So we got a pretty good curve here happening. And then here's July. And as we cross into August, you know, these temperatures like fall and the range falls. That's, that's the onset of, of uh, rain. Right. I don't know about the rest of you, but after like mid July, by the time I hit August, I was starting to think like, crap, do I need to be start building a boat? Because it was like, God, every freaking day in, in, in my diary, right? I keep a little di grow diary, right? Of events, you know, here in, in August, right? Look at that. That was a that was actually a sunny day. I, I wrote my 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 plant diary. Oh, my God, the sun's out today. <laughs> You know, on these days, you know, where you see a little bit of peak, right? Those were days where the sun came out for like a couple hours. Yippee. So on the flip side of this, right? Because it's constantly rainy, right? We get all the way to October, right? I don't hit a picking temperature until here, mid-October. Because cloud cover prevents solar radiation, right? So I don't get a killing, I don't get a frost where I'm, I'm really worried I'm, my apples are going to freeze on the tree, right? Until mid-October and look at my growing degree days, right? I get up to a little over 2,700 growing degree days. That's not bad, right? But the rain, 
the trade-off is that the constant rain caused all the apples to be less sweet. I lost a bricks, at least one bricks off my apples. Compared to the previous season, which actually was short, but was sunnier, I had better sugar actually on the apples that made it ripe. So normally I'd have a bricks of about 13. This year it was like, you know, 12 or 11. And so that became one of the criteria, right? I'm, I'm looking at my varieties like, well, which of my varieties actually still produce pretty good sugar amounts in this really crappy, cloudy, rainy end of the half of the summer? And I actually found a variety that I, I actually performed pretty good. So, you know, this spring, you know, one tree's getting dug up <laughs> and other one's getting planted. It's like, well, because rainy, rainy falls is just not something that's going to go away here in Alaska. So kind of sum this up, your season lengths determined by the number of growing degree days you get. Anchorage average is, you know, probably 2,500 now. Uh, I'm sure it was probably closer to, uh, to 2,200 a couple decades ago. So it has gone up, but most commercial apples are gonna require 3,000 to 4,500. So the problem of radiational cooling, chill hours, and even talk about that. Um, not this past fall, but the previous fall, after, you know, that season, we had a really big uh, cold snap in mid-September. Well, then the temperatures in October and November hovered right around between 30 and 40 degrees until we had a real, our first big snow towards the end of November, and then temperatures went to like minus 15. And fruit trees, um, they have a base hardiness, which is generally for most fruit trees is around zero degrees. But if they are exposed, if they're kept at 32 or below consistently, they will start to develop what we call enhanced hardiness. And this can allow them to survive temperatures down to minus 30 or even maybe even a bit more. And so what happened that season? They didn't get a chance to get increased hardiness. Temperatures go, right? So I had, a, I had, you know, you found out right away, well, oh, that was, that variety obviously wasn't, <clears throat> was marginally hardy, right? Because spring, it's dead. <laughs> so, so anyway, so th these are, these are things that you kind of learn as you go. Snow, you're right. Snow is a great thing. It can provide insulation, but it also provides habitat for voles. Right, so you have to have little screens around your fruit trees and stuff that if you don't want those little guys to find them and start chewing on them. Um, and then, of course, when the spring comes, like now, and the snow is melting, of course, if it's if it's so deep, like it's been this past year, where it's above the top scaff, the first scaffold of of limbs, as it comes down, it pulls on those limbs, and on young trees especially, it it breaks them. Right, so we're seeing a lot of lot of uh, branch breakage, rain limits bricks, and if you're growing cherries. It just makes your life miserable. And if you're like doing raspberries, you know, and then you're out there picking in the rain because if you don't, you're going to lose your crop. Whatever our assets, it's not all bad. Actually, there's some really good things about growing here in Alaska. Weather during the summer, well, it's mild, right? Last year, you saw the pictures of the apple tree, apples cooking on the trees in the Northwest. They were baked right? 120 degrees, not good for an apple or a raspberry, unless you like raisins, right? <laughs> I mean, they were just, they were toasted. Um, our dry springs, generally here in Alaska, we don't start off rainy, we start off dry. And so it's not conducive to fungal or bacterial issues that are prevalent in the lower 48. So fire blight, apple scab, powdery mildew, bitter and summer rots, really uncommon. You know, as an advisor, you know, I have to actually study this stuff in case I actually see it someday. <laughs> but it's not like I'm seeing it all the time. I only saw fire blight once since I've been in Alaska, and that was up, up in the Lammers Orchard up in, in Fairbanks. Uh, insects that are common in lower 48, not common yet. Um, so we don't have the problems of cotyledon moth, spotted wing drops, ophelia, ample maggot, spotter and lanternfly and all that stuff. And so it makes it relatively easy to grow organically here. You know, I only had the, the biggest surprise I've had as a pest is I found European fruit scale one year in my orchard. 
And actually, I saw it in a couple of places around town. And I'm like emailing people, showing them pictures, going, hey, this is what this is. You know, you don't want it. Start doing something about it. And of course, you know, the other benefit around here is that water is readily available, right? Which isn't the case in most places in the country. So in summary, is commercial fruit tree cultivation Alaska's future? And no. You know, you're going to be kind of limited to basically doing you pick or or if you are growing something and you've got a dedicated buyer, right? Like, you know, one of the breweries wants your apples, right? So they can make hard cider or make a, an apple beer. And there you go. You can sell that, but you're not going to make a living on it. You better have a day job or a good retirement, right? So no full-time orchard income. It's going to be an adjunct always. And although climate is warming, the weather variability is increasing. And so uh, you can't just, you can't grow at the efficiencies that you can in lower 48. Everything is more costly here. You've got less growing degree days, land availability. And basically, if you want dependable cropping, you're going to be growing everything in a high tunnel. Right? So you can't, you know, think about cherries, right? They grow cherries, thousands of acres of cherries in, in Washington state grown in a desert. Why? Because then they don't crack when it rains. And if, it, if they get an accidental rain, it's boo-hoo time, right? But mostly it's dry. And so they can crop cherries growing outside. No problem. Here in Alaska, no. You want to grow sweet cherries? You better have them, you know, you better either be willing to run out there as soon as it starts raining and pick it and hope that it's ripe, um, or you're going to have some cracked cherries. So if you're going to do it dependably, you got to do it under a high tunnel. Um, so anyway, apples um, add insult to injury. Um, there's no infrastructure up here for apple growing. We have no packing houses. We have no controlled atmospheric storage so or distribution network. So even if you grew the apples, well, what would you do with them? This is why we have U-Pick operations, right? Um, and of course, the popular long season cultivars, if you had high tunnels, you could grow Honeycrisp up here and some of the more popular cultivars because you'd get an extension in your season. Cherries, less infrastructure is needed. Um, you can generate multiple revenue streams, right? You can sell juice, you can uh, have a dried product, which is easy to ship and low cost to ship outside to sell. Um, you can do jams, wine, that sort of thing. But again, you have to grow them in a high tunnel. Last year in Michigan, just to give you an idea, Mount Morency, the, the classic sour cherry growing in, in uh, uh, that we all probably grew up with when you think about cherry pie, the bricks on that last year in Michigan was like ungodly. It was like 16 or 17. I mean, almost like a sweet cherry, right? What was it here in Alaska? My Evans, 12. And I'm leaving them on to the very end of the season, trying to get as much sugar out of them as I can. The, uh, the, the uh, um, dwarfing uh, cherries, what they call the romance series out of University of Saskatchewan, they'll bricks out a little bit higher, but they also are not as crack resistant. So um, there's always some trade-offs with that. So with that, uh, depressing little presentation. I'll let you ask me questions. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll have uh, I'll run the mic out if you want to use that mic. For oh, questions. okay. Do we have questions? <clears throat> Do you know of anybody that's that's fussing with serviceberry? With what? Serviceberry, amelanchier. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I, I I have, and uh, you know there are people that actually like the serviceberry. Um, but the birds especially like it. And so even though I was growing the service berries, um, it was really difficult trying to net them because of how they grow. They kind of grow spindly and tall. And, uh, um, but a couple of the varieties are actually pretty decent eating. There's a variety called Martin, uh, which is pretty decent, but I also grow blueberries. And uh, I can grow blueberries pretty successfully. And, um, you know, if you gave me both on a plate and, you know, I would probably be eating all the blueberries first. So, 
Um, but yeah, they're hardy and they, they will grow up here and they're actually kind of interesting how they flower. They, they have some, some beauty that way. They pro they basically, uh, spread out as a kind of a bush. So they're always setting up roots, new suckers, basically around the base of the plant. So you end up with this kind of cluster of, of stems coming up over time. Um, but like I said, you have to you have to have a strategy for birds because, uh, uh, the robins will uh, go after them uh, vigorously. <laughs> so for those of us that live in Southeast where a rain is uh, our friend, I guess, uh, can you go to that website you had originally for cultivars? I mean, I'm assuming some of the ones that you grow up here aren't going to grow in Southeast or not as well or. Yeah. Like yeah. You know, your, 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 your issues are different, right? So you've, you've got rain, but you, you may actually have a little bit more, growing degree day accumulation, right? So the season length thing may not be as severe for you as, as what it is as you go, go farther north. It, you know, the, the thing I'm trying to do, um, you know, most states in the lower 48, of course, they have university extension services uh, because fruit growing fruit is a really important economic um, area. So they spend millions and millions of dollars in research and in development and especially in weather. So um, in Michigan, for example, um, you can go anywhere in the, in the state and you can, you can find real-time data about what your growing degree days are. And here you can't. So I can't tell you, like, I don't know how many growing degree days you get in Juneau because nobody's got a logger there. There's no... There's no um, weather service, you know, creating that information. And so it's hard to judge. And this, this is where you have to kind of rely on, well, you look at, you know, anybody who's growing in your area, like there's a Chilcat, uh, there's a group in the Southeast called the Chilcat Orchard Project or something like that. I think they're located in Haines. And, uh, you know, what I would do is I'd reach out to them like, well, what things are you having success with? And, uh, and, and try and do it that way. Awesome. We have about two more questions. So what apple uh, are you going to use for sweetness? Um, there's a variety that's uh, just been developed in uh, Minnesota. Um, it's still under plant patent, um, but I've, I, 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 I uh, grafted uh, one limb to try. Now I will cut that off, <laughs> but I just wanted to test it to, to see. But uh, it's called Kinder Crisp, and uh, um, it's a uh, it's a smaller what they call kind of a lunchbox in the tray. They call it a lunchbox size apple. Um, but that apple I put in the crappiest location in my yard, um, so it did not get full sun. Um, most of the seeds when we picked them at in uh, October, um, the seeds were just starting to turn, but they were not even fully ripe. Some of them had the uh, seeds inside were still completely white, and uh, but it still bricked out at fourteen. In other words, even unripe, it was a it was actually my best tasting apple <laughs> that season. And I'm like, well, okay, gonna go gonna put that in. So the tree that's going out is called State Fair. It's another. Uh, it's a, another apple developed by University of Minnesota, but it does not like uh, wet falls. So State Fair and Zestar are two kind of interrelated trees. And when it's wet in the fall, they don't develop a really crisp texture. And for me, uh, that's that's a downer. I want an apple I buy into that's crisp and crunchy if I'm going to use it as a dessert apple. And uh, and so the, the Kinder Crips knocked all those boxes off. Right. And, and even storage, it, it's not the best storage apple, but but it stayed under refrigeration. OK, for, you know, uh, six weeks. So it was it was not bad that way. Any other questions? <clears throat> I know you just uh, you mentioned growing nuts. And the question I have is in northern Maine and in northern Michigan, and Minnesota, there is a beak hazelnut that grows there. And in the soil conditions, it's kind of where we would find uh, toe slopes, heavier, heavier soils, toe slopes, a little high moisture. Has anybody ever done anything in Alaska with the beak hazelnut? I'd like to introduce a new exotic invasive. No, the, the, just be well, one. The, the hazelnuts, you know, hazelnuts are, are the nut that are, is under development. There's actually a, 
a group uh, working out of Minnesota, um, and, it's, and I forget the exact name, but it's called something like the Hazelnut Project. And they're actually uh, um, doing basically looking for um, cultivars that are hardy and in, sh in shorter season. And for, you know, for everybody, you know, as far as nuts, you know, I, I kind of thought the same thing moving to Alaska. I thought like, well, you know, some of these nut trees must grow up here, but, but the season's not long enough. And most nuts require a, a long season. You know, if you think about like when those nuts are being harvested in, in upper Michigan or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's fall and uh, growing degree days. They're way past, even in uh, upper state Michigan, they're way past our growing degree day amount. Yeah. So, so yeah, so not, eh, not so much yet, but maybe in the future. Right. So. Awesome. It looks like we do have time for one more question before lunch. <laughs> I, I noticed that you've already had your grafting workshop for this year. Yeah. Um, is that generally the time you, I thought you said in May and that one was like mid April. When right. We, we do our grafting workshop. Usually, uh, usually the, April, like this year, it was April fifteenth. Um, sometimes it depends on the calendar. It can it can move into that third week? But we try to do it at that point in time because um, we're shipping rootstock up from the lower forty-eight, and um, the rootstock has to be kept under refrigeration um, to keep it dormant. And the longer the, the longer you kind of go into the spring, the harder that is um, to do. Um, and we want our members to to uh, exchange cyan wood, and generally, if if they're like like this year, they can be out there collecting cyan wood right up to the grafting workshop, and everything is still dormant. If we were to go later in the in the April, uh, like last year, it was like April twenty, I want to say twenty third. You know, because that spring was a warmer spring, stuff was already buds were already starting to push, and it was actually too late to harvest cyan wood by the time we got to the to the grafting workshop. So we always do that grafting workshop then. And for like apples, it works out fine because you graft the apple. Um, you can actually just put it in a cool, dark spot, you know, like your garage or something, something that's like around 50 degrees and leave it alone for a couple of weeks. And that um, graft will, will callus uh, during that time. And then you can bring it out, temporarily pot it or something and, and grow it. Um, cherries, you have to kind of put inside because they, they want to callus. Uh, at warmer temperatures. Um, so if you're trying to graft cherries earlier, but that's why the top working workshops where we're working with trees that are growing outside, uh, we don't do those until, you know, usually mid-May, you know, like like for me, I'll be doing mine out. The first outside trees will be May 13th here in, in Anchorage. Um, the top working workshop up in the Valley will be on May 6th, but it will be using um, greenhouse nursery stock. It'll be at Mid Valley in Wasilla, yeah. So Mark, the owner up there, he's he's really he's really being really super supportive about you know uh, wanting to know what things you know he should be buying to sell to his customers and hosting workshops and stuff like that. So so anyway, yeah. So that's that's kind of the reason why there's that little change in um, in time. So all right. Well, thank you, Mark. That was a great presentation. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for appreciate it.